Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this worshiping spirit we have today. We thank you for our souls crying out, hallelujah, unto your name. Thank you for empowering us on this day. Lord, empower me, your servant, to give this word you've placed upon my heart. Let it penetrate even the hardest of hearts that some may cry out, give their life unto thee. Those who are saved, that their work for you may be renewed. That their faith may be ignited and grow ever the more. Bless us as we share in your word this morning. Let us say amen and bless God. Let us put our hands together again for the Lord. A very familiar passage of scripture here today comes from Matthew chapter 28, starting at the first verse. And I want you to remain seated on today and just hear these words and just imagine you being in and a part of this account. After the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake for the angel of the Lord came down from heaven. Going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, do not be afraid. For I know that you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. He has risen just as he said. Come see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you in Galilee. There you will see him. Now I've told you. So the women hurried from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he says. They came to him, clasped his feet and worshipped him. And Jesus says to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. While the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported the chief priest everything that had happened. When the chief priest had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, you are to say his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. This story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority... In heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Very quickly, I want to use for a subject this morning, He has risen. He has risen. <clears throat> the gospel in Greek, it's pronounced yo angelion. Yo angelion. This word gospel means good news. The gospel is the good news that God is restoring our broken lives. Through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
You know, we've become very familiar with the crucifixion. And the crucifixion is very important for us. But the crucifixion is not the yo angelion. It is not the good news. The good news is the resurrection. Too often we leave Jesus on the cross with some of our jewelry, pictorial descriptions. You know, when I was a, a child in Mississippi, we went to a church, and there was something at that church that was very impactful for me. In the lower level would be their fellowship hall. There, there, was, there, there was a picture of two women, and they were at a cave-like opening where it looked like a stone had been moved. And the look on their face faces as the artist painted the picture was one of fear, one of astonishment, one of excitement, all at the same time. And I was just so intrigued and fascinated and drawn to that photo every time I saw it. All of the depictions of the cross and Jesus being on the cross, they're all fine. But it was something about looking at the light in that empty tomb that resonated with me. All of my unsaved life and now in my saved life. You see, this, this picture spans beyond our religious beliefs. Whether you choose to follow Jesus or not, you cannot ignore this picture of the empty tomb and what it means you got to deal with it. <clears throat> Excuse me. For Christians, this is the picture upon which we hold and hang our faith, our belief, and more importantly, our hope for the future. Because we serve an alive Savior. We, we cannot go to a graveyard and worship a, a tombstone because we serve a Savior that is alive, a Lord that is alive with us and for us and through us. Many who are Christians, they struggle mightily with the reality of the resurrection because there are so many that are completely opposed to it. They call it fiction. Stories that have been made up. All regarding its validity. All since it's happened. We see in our scripture. They, 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 they continue to try to refute. Negate. And debunk the resurrection. You know, good news is not good if it's a lie. <clears throat> good news is not good if it's false. So on this day, Resurrection Sunday, the question before us is how can I be sure of the resurrection? How can I be sure that he is risen? Because one of the things about the, the human experience, we only do and respond to that which we believe. If we don't believe it, then our actions will speak to that. So I want us to be confident in the good news that he is risen. And for a moment, I just want to just analyze this because, you know, as a people, we're about as smart as we've ever been. I didn't say we were wise in everything we did, but, but we smart. We know some things, and if we don't, we just get on the computer and figure it out. <clears throat> but I want to, um, one of the things that really helped me, you know, I'm a, I'm a math person, and I really love math. I just did math just for hobbies. I would just make up my own algebra problems. Don't, don't look at me like that. I just did. And one, one course in mathematics that really resonated with me, and I use it in my thinking today, is geometry. 
and proof texting things. If then, I know some people that just checked out right there. Geometry done. But it, it, it framed my logical thinking. And as I applied some of the techniques that I used in, in, in advanced geometry, I just want to look at what we have here. We can believe he is risen, firstly, because of the dramatic change in the disciples. Okay? Now, if you read the complete story, you, you look at the disciples while all of the this was going down with Jesus on the cross. Yeah, understand that they wasn't at the cross crying. They was in hiding. Because it, it, it wasn't good to be close to Jesus. You may be up on that cross with him. So, so they, were in, they were afraid. They were in hiding. They were nowhere to be found. Then two months later. They resurface. They're not afraid. They're full of joy and confidence and courage, despite the persecution. Now, I want to tell you that during this time, it wasn't like us. We can just come and, in our Sunday best and just worship Jesus. No, this was a time where belief in the resurrected Christ, you will be burned at the stake. You will be beheaded for their belief in the resurrection, let alone trying to preach it and teach it. I want you to think about someone you love, you're very close to, and you've spent every minute with this person for three years. This person dies a brutal, grotesque death at the hands of murderers. Let me just say this. For me, in two months, I would still be trying to get over that. I would still be confused. The, the picture would still be in my head. I would be angry and grieving and wanting justice for my loved one who was murdered. But if they were resurrected, that would give me a new confidence a new courage, joy, even boldness in the face of persecution because I am serving someone who has beat death. And this bizarre group of mostly uneducated men would respond to what they saw and experienced and change the world. And thousands of years later, we're still talking about it. Let me tell you something about human nature. If Jesus left them a letter, it wouldn't provoke a change. It wouldn't invoke a change like this. If technology existed back then and Jesus was leave them a recording, it wouldn't invoke a change like this. But if I believed you to be dead, and now I saw you and talked to you, received instruction from you, and now I have your spirit in me, that would provoke a change in me to give my life Living the your angelion, spreading the good news of what I have saw, what I believe, and what is good for you. We can believe he is risen because of the eyewitness accounts. Do you know that there's 11 times in the Bible recorded that Jesus appeared to people after his death. He appeared to individuals. He appeared to his disciples. At one time, he appeared to 500 people. Okay. <clears throat> now realize this. When the biblical accounts were written. Now, I want you to know that as 
the Bible was being lived out, there was nobody there writing it down. 30, 40, 50 years later was when the Bible was starting to be put together, the Gospels. And, and many of the people were still alive that remember what happened and what they saw. They could have denied that it ever happened, but they didn't. Some people today claim that it was all hallucinations. And, you know, I could understand that. And I received that if it was only a few people. It could have been simply wish fulfillment. Because, let me, let me tell you, if you love someone so much and you miss them so much that, that sometimes your mind will play tricks on you and you're like, I saw him last night. He talked to me. But Jesus didn't just appear to individuals. He appeared to groups of people. And let me tell you, um, hallucinations aren't group events. And no matter, even if drugs are involved, we still don't all see the same thing. We may see a myriad of things, but we ain't going to see the same thing. And, and the truth of having 500 people experience the same hallucination at the same time, that's a greater miracle than the resurrection itself. <clears throat> Listen to this. In our system of justice, we, we have people convicted or exonerated based on the eyewitness account of one person, one person, w would you believe Jesus is risen based on the eyewitness account of 500 people? Just a thought. Now, we can believe Jesus is risen be because the Roman and Jewish leaders, they could not disprove it. When the chief priests had met with the elders, they devised the plan, gave soldiers money. And I thought about, I'm like, what, what is going on here? Let me explain. One of the key reasons they wanted Jesus dead and to debunk the resurrection, it came down to money. Listen to me, money. See, temple sacrifice was big business. The elders were guilty of improper balance scales in the temple. It was just a racketeering enterprise. They were making money hand over fist. This is why when Jesus rode into Jerusalem about a week before this, he just wreaked havoc, turned over tables of the money changers. Because they were robbing people in the temple in the name of God. Well, if Jesus is resurrected, it's going to bring an end to this. The money temple sacrifices brought in. We can't have that. For the soldiers guarding the tomb. I want you to know that these were not just some keystone cops. They were not Barney Fife. These were trained killers. For them to let a prisoner go, they didn't play that. You would be killed on the spot. It was that serious. No trial, dead. This is why they were paid off by the Jewish leaders and the Jewish leaders gave them a made-up story to tell people. Now understand, even the made-up story would get them killed. So that's why they say, well, if it gets to the governor, we'll take care of him because it was all about the money. They tried to cover up, desperately wanted to, but they couldn't. 
They couldn't produce a body. They couldn't, they couldn't show that the body was stolen. They, 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 they couldn't say that it was in a different grave. They, they couldn't explain away why highly trained soldiers failed. They couldn't explain away the appearances, not to just one, but 500. They had all the motivation in the world to squash this new religion, but they were not able to because they couldn't disprove it. So we can have the power to believe he is risen because those who had the most motivation to get rid of him couldn't. Lastly, this morning, <clears throat> we can believe he is risen because of the martyred deaths of so many believers. This word martyr means that I'm dying for what I believe in. The most impactful proof to me. What I hang my faith in the resurrection on the testimony, uh, not on the testimony of the apostles, but, but what their actions say it to me. The, the, these disciples were willing to die for what they believe. Now. We've been talking about natural instincts for the past couple of weeks. Two that we're born with, procreation, survival. These things that we will instinctively do. We will naturally protect our life, this life that's given to us, instinctively. In that vein, what that means is we will not, in good conscience, in my right mind, give our life to something we know to be a lie. Now, we'll give our life for something that we believe to be the truth, but if we know it's a lie, at the end, I'm going to pull up. What am I saying? That if Jesus did not resurrect, there is no way that so many would have given their life to what they know to be a lie. And more so, do you realize that the disciples had nothing to gain? Let me tell you. It'd be like, you know what? I'm just going to act like this last three years didn't happen. And I'm going to go back fishing. Because I know how to do that. I'm not going to run around here where every day could be my last day. I'm going on the boat. See you, Jesus. But they couldn't. They couldn't deny what they saw, what they experienced. Their lives would change forever. And many of them would die violent deaths for what they saw. They would be beaten, imprisoned, persecuted, killed for their testimony of the resurrection. This is what I base my proof of the resurrection on. So as I see it, it's a fact that can't be ignored. It's a fact that can be easily proven even outside of the Bible. So what do we do with this information? How do we respond to this yo angelion? Jesus is resurrected. He is risen. Now what? What does that mean for me in my life? How does it change me? Does it change me the same way it changed the disciples? Am I willing to die to self and live a life spreading and living the euangelion? Does it empower me to live different than the world? Does it strengthen me in the midst of the storm? Does it motivate me to do things that I've never done before as I am led by the Holy Spirit? Or does it do nothing for me? What is my response to the good news this morning? This death, resurrection, means that now I can be perfect before God. Even though my life 
may be imperfect. What the resurrection means to me is that I will never know the sting of death. <clears throat> what the resurrection means to me is, is that I won't know hell. And, and if you've been around here enough, you, you know, I don't I don't talk about hell. You know why? Because I'm not trying to scare you into heaven. If your desire for heaven is not because you love the Lord, this is a waste of time. When somebody says, when I say, why, why do you want to go to heaven? Because I don't want to go to hell. Huh. So if it's a third choice, you'd at least explore it is what you're saying? The resurrection means that I am prepared for glory. The resurrection means that I have been freed from the bondage or slavery of sin. The resurrection for me means that sin is no longer my master. The resurrection means that I was finally free to love myself. Because be before Jesus, there was some self-hate. Mm. Maybe it's just the resurrection for me means that that I can now love you unconditionally because without Jesus, oh, there's going to be some conditions and many of them you won't even be able to meet. Nowhere in any of the scriptures does Jesus ever conduct a funeral. The ones he attended never ended in burial. The resurrection power was always present in Christ. He is the resurrection and the life. You know, there, there, is, there, is, there is overcoming power in the resurrection of Christ. Christ empowers us to be more than conquerors through the calamity that may come our way. I want you to listen to me and we're almost done. What gives a widow courage as she stands over a fresh grave? What is the ultimate hope of an amputee, the abuse, the burn victim, how can parents of a brain damaged or physically handicapped child keep from living their entire life totally and completely depressed? Why, why would anyone who is blind or deaf or paralyzed be encouraged when they think of life beyond the physical? Where do the thoughts of, of young people go when they finally recover from the grief of losing a child. When a family received tragic news that their little daughter was found dead, or the father was killed in a plane crash, or the son has overdosed on drugs, what single truth then becomes their focus so that they don't absolutely lose their mind? What is the final answer to pain and mourning and insanity and terminal diseases and such calamities and fatal accidents? What gives meaning to the horrors of life, the reality of death? It is the bodily resurrection of Jesus. You see... The Gospels do not explain the resurrection. The resurrection explains the Gospels. You see, belief in the resurrection is not an accessory of the Christian faith. It is the Christian faith. As Christians, we, we understand that the resurrection, God turns everything Upsides down. Jesus was put to death. Yet God the Father said 
a resounding no to death. He raised him from the dead. Sin and death were defeated. Everlasting life was made possible for all who know him as Savior and Lord. He is risen. He is risen. He is risen. Church, the tomb is empty. <clears throat> Even children understand something remarkable happened on that glorious day that the tomb was empty. Even me as a child that didn't even have no theology at all, looking at that picture, it did something to me. There was a small orphan boy who lived with his grandmother. And one night, the house caught fire. The little boy's room was on the second floor. And the grandmother trying to get up to save her grandchild. She was overcome by smoke and flames and died. The crowd gathered around the burning house. And the boy's cry for help was heard above the crackling bra uh, blaze. No one seemed to know what to do. Suddenly a stranger came from the crowd and he circled to the back of the house and he saw an iron pipe that led up to the bedroom window. A few minutes he disappeared and he came back with the child in his arms. The crowd cheered. As he climbed down the pipe and the boy hung around his neck. Weeks later, they had a public hearing because that's what they did back then to decide who's going to get custody of this now famous orphan. Each person that wanted the child was they given a chance to speak. And the first man says, you know, I got a big farm. And everybody needs to be outdoors. So I want to take the child. The second man says, I'm a teacher. I have a large library. And I can give this boy an education like he wouldn't believe. And finally, the richest man in the community stepped forth. And he says, you know, I'm rich. I could give this boy everything that everybody's already mentioned. The farm, education, I got money, we can travel. I like him in my home. So the judge says, does anybody else want to say something? And from the back seat rolls this stranger. He kind of slipped in unnoticed and he walked up toward the front. Deep suffering showed on the man's face. Reaching the front of the room, he stood directly in front of the boy and he removed his hands from his pockets. And the whole crowd just gasped. The little boy whose eyes had been focused on the floor with everybody talking about him and making a big deal about him, he now looked up and he saw this man's hands who were terribly scarred. Suddenly, the boy just cried with recognition of this man who had saved his life. And he leaped around his neck and he held on for dear life. See, the boy knew that this person whom he's trusted with his life sacrificed to save him. And he could see it in his hands. Those marred hands spoke volumes about the worth of the little boy and what this man had sacrificed for his life. What, what do these nail-scarred hands, what do they speak to you? Because there are many vying for custody of you. 
See, the world in all of its vastness says, hey, you can explore and have the freedom to, to travel. Yet, your spirit will still feel imprisoned. There is education that's vying for custody. And says, you know, we can, we can teach you so much. That you get to the point where you know everything about nothing. There are riches of the world vying for custody of you. This endless pursuit of worldly treasure. It says you could just have things beyond your wildest dreams. All shiny and new. You see, earthly treasures are nothing but just repackaged dust that we've assigned value to. And there is one who loved you before there was a you. One whose hands bear the scar of love for you. He sacrificed his life for you and for me. A life not only in the right now, but a life eternal. He loved us before there was in us. He sacrificed his life for us. And through him, we'll be able to understand life freely live life and have that life more abundantly what do the nail scarred hands mean to you will you go on like you never saw it never knew it never good or cared about the your angelion you see this is a message about love and Jesus says, I love you through your pain. I love you through your hurt. I love you through your whatever experience you may have had that you're still holding on to. Jesus says, let me love you. Let me love you. Too often we, we just compartmentalize what Sunday morning is we come get dressed up for a couple of hours we hear some songs and we hear a few words and we just go on about our business but see that um, that little boy was able to live a life with someone who loved him to sacrifice before he even knew that little boy. That's that unconditional love that we're all looking for. And Christ is saying, look. When you finish with all the dead ends in your life. When you're finished with all the broken relationships. That you thought would be. Try me. Because I got proof. That I love you. And the proof. Is in my resurrection. The proof is in my nail scarred hands. Will you explore? Get to know me. I know you better than you. And I have a plan for your life. Don't let the enemy tell you. That I don't have a plan for your life. Don't let the enemy tell you. That your sins are too great to be forgiven by me. Don't let the enemy keep you from an eternity with me. Don't be confused by the enemy. My actions should show and speak volumes about my love and my plan for you. Let us pray today.